basement door is weather-worn. The copper nails holding the upholstery in place have turned green from sea air, and there's a knocker shaped like a lion's head. The Royal Lion, Guillaume's Kitten. This knocker will last a lifetime and then some. You knock silently. The upholstery muffles the sound. No response comes from the apartment. I guess no one is in. You feel eyes on you, watching you from the window overlooking the yard. You're pretty sure the owner of the apartment isn't here. It's safish. The leather upholstery is worn and rough against your jaw. You don't hear any movement. In fact, it's oddly silent in the yard around you. No birds chirp. Lieutenant, what is your opinion of this task we're undertaking? Let's be honest. This isn't what I joined the RCM for. But every day tells you something new about yourself. Apparently, working with the local union boss to get info on an investigation is not something I'm squeamish about. So you don't mind if I unlock the door? If the Merc Tribunal happens before we solve this, we are looking at casualties. What's one unlocked door compared to that? On the other hand, we could just leave and tell Evrat we opened the door. No one seems to be tailing us to see if we actually did it. Lie to Evrat? That's also an option? Yes. Presenting a fabrication is known to get results here and there. You took this task. You make the call. The door is right here. You can just open it and be done with this. Besides, if you never open it, you're never gonna find out what's behind the door. I don't know. You're a pretty good liar. Are you as good an infiltrator as you are a liar? You try to be as silent as you can. It takes a bit of rattling of the handle to loosen the bolt. Finally, the door unlocks with a small clack. Thoughts race through your head. The sound of the key turning still echoes in the yard. Hopefully no one heard. Well, buddy, you opened it. No need to go inside. It would be rude. Good job. Let's go now. I'm sure there's nothing interesting in there. There's nothing else to do than to leave and tell Everard. No conceivable reason for you to intrude on the premises. Only curiosity could account for stepping over that threshold. Maybe there's treasure in there. A white alligator. A fountain of quicksilver. There might be important information in the apartment. I mean, there might. As you hold the open door, you can feel the air moving. A little draft, a whistle. This is the flag of Rivershaw, the suzerainty. What's with the sun? This isn't just one sun, but there are little suns dancing around the big sun. This is the sevenfold sun miracle. What's the sevenfold sun miracle? It's an optical atmospheric anomaly the first settlers saw. Happens in cold weather. Six small suns around the big one. This complex halo phenomena is how old Revachol got its flag. It is but one of the many strange optic atmospheric phenomenon of this wondrous archipelago. You're sure you once saw sun dogs in your youth and blue flares. Lieutenant, the old flag of the suzerain. Mm-hmm. The tenant is an old-fashioned guy. By old-fashioned, he means very right wing. The lieutenant does not bow to the flag. It accepts your salute with quiet dignity. It is not my flag, he thinks. My flag is the signal blue of the zone of control.
A row of mugs sits on the shelf. Each one depicts a human figure. A dark-skinned woman grinning amidst mysterious symbols. A broad-shouldered man shoveling potatoes and others. A little ring. Though cheerful, the images on the ceramic make you vaguely uncomfortable. There's something disdainful in the way the curves and lines of the bodies were drawn. The images betray a lack of interest in human beings. They are merely unflattering caricatures. What do I mean, uncomfortable? The owner of these mugs doesn't like people of other ethnicities very much. Come on, it's just a bit of fun with a pinch of truth. People have the right to make fun of each other in a free world. Of course, so very free. And so fun. The lieutenant picks up one of the mugs, then puts it back down with a look of disdain. I'm beginning to feel better about breaking into this man's apartment. Yes, your broken mug friend would feel very much at home here. The same humor, the same mocking lines. There's the missing tin soldier. Whoever lives here might have used the Whirling's container to dump his trash. And now they've drawn the ire of the Union. The plot thickens, as they say. An interesting little clue. Let's see where this goes. Clues have a way of magically connecting to other clues down the road. Perhaps you should break into apartments more often. Do you really think it's the same person who put the dead man's clothes in the trash? Who knows? I'm not expecting too much from this clothes in the trash lead either way. It might turn out to be some random local matter, but still, a nice coincidence. You could ask Everard who this person is, once you're done here. You see a young man on a balcony, nursing a cigarette. His eyes have been following you for a while. Not looking for any trouble, officer. It's the voice of someone who has something to hide, my liege. You hiding something? Speak up. This is the police. There's no trouble. I'm just speaking in a lowered voice. I don't want to be seen talking to the gendarmerie if that's okay. I just want to finish my cigarette. It's the god of cigarettes and youth. Ask him if he's got anything to spare. Don't let him go. This could be your witness. The balcony has a great view of the whole thing. Hold on. Can I at least have a cigarette? Apologies, but this is my last one. The god himself has denied you absolution. I need absolution. Absolution? I don't know that brand, but I'm pretty sure you can get Astra's at the Frit. Can't you just, like, toss that one down? I'm not sure that's a good idea. Shut up and throw, kid. I'm not throwing anything. There's no way you'd catch that cigarette anyway. What? Really? Yes, really. Don't even try. You'll just embarrass yourself. You're right. That was obviously a bad idea. Forget I said anything. As you wish. Actually, the gender mayor really needs to talk to you. Is it really that important? Like a nervous cat, he keeps stealing looks at the neighboring windows. All right, but make it quick. Once I finish this cigarette, I have to run. By God, this young man has the body of a decathlete. His lithe form was practically made for vaulting over the high bar. Son, do you train? Occasionally. Why? Are you on the track team? No. I just like to look good. A shame. Young men like you with a body like yours, you'd be a credit for any track team. Trust me, I'm not a team player. Can you tell me your name? My name? My name is Martin Martinez. That's definitely not his real name. 
You're not actually called Martin Martinez, are you? No, of course not. Could you please lower your voice? Ask him again. Listen, I really need your name. And I really need to finish this cigarette. But he hasn't left yet. I need to get inside this apartment building. Can you help me? Help you? No, sorry, gendarme. I have to run. Looks like you get a good view of the warning's backyard. Can you tell me anything about the hanging? I can tell that you finally got him down. Thank you. It was quite a disturbing sight, even by Martinet's standards. What were you doing last Sunday? Oh. You already asked me that, didn't you? Wait. Is someone else investigating the lynching? Did you? No, not you two. Some more muscular type. And when did you speak to this more muscular gentleman? Last week? I don't know. Look. A downy blanket of white to cover up the miserable poverty of the scene. You didn't answer the question. What were you doing last Sunday? <sighs> I had a friend over. What kind of friend? He was my Sunday friend. A Sunday friend? How intriguing. Makes sense. Friends are nice on Sunday. You don't have to work. You can just spend time with pals, watching rugby and drinking beer. What's your friend's real name? Do you see something? He doesn't reply, gesturing no with his cigarette. Under the grey sky, snow continues to pile on the neighboring window sills. Someone hides behind a curtain. Those windows have eyes, and those eyes are watching, spying on you three. All right, we'll talk later. No. We won't. Now, if you'll excuse me, I really need to get going. This isn't the place or time for questions. Who knows who might be watching from the distance, hidden behind the curtains? Hey, listen. I'm just trying to make things okay again. Can we meet again somewhere else? For a moment, the man on the balcony seems almost vulnerable. Something moves in the depths of his feline eyes. Compassion and a hint of understanding. There's snow gathering on his hair and on his shoulders. A speckle of white against the purple that hangs loose on his slender frame. I am sorry, but I really don't have the information you're looking for. But, hold on, what's that? For a split second, his hand lingers, as though gesturing towards a stone placed right next to the front door. It's a sign. Good luck with the investigation. He's gone. We should run after him, see where he went. No point in running. Tenements like these often have multiple exits. If he doesn't want to talk to us, then he'll know how to hide himself. So we just give up? He could be a witness. Him or his Sunday friend. Either way, we need to look into that muscular type who's asking about our case. He did leave us a sign. Did you see that? He wanted to draw our attention to that stone right over there. If we find a way inside the building, we can ask around for his apartment. Great, let's do that. A stone, like any other, lying in a whirl of sleet and mud. Maybe there's something under it. There's a key beneath it, rusty from the dirt. This must be for the front door. Pity he doesn't have the apartment number on it. This building has many apartments, and a man can be in any of them. How are we going to find the right one? We'll just have to go in and see.
Give me a moment. The cold never does any good for my bronchitis. <laughs> this woman's health is failing her. There's not much to do. Not in this damp. Are you alright? Should I call a doctor? I'm fine. Fine. Don't you worry about me. <laughs> You're still worried. It's very worrying. Now. What do you want from me, policeman? She's the cleaning lady. She knows the floor plan and the residence. Who are you? I'm no one. Just an old woman who cleans these hallways. Do you live here? If you can call it living. I have a little room upstairs right next to the coal room. It's barely bigger than a closet. But I don't complain, no. I have my bed and my aching bones to keep me company. And that's all I need from this world. And all she gets, too. The coastal wind beats down hard on the coal room door, outside. Splashes of waves make the balcony slippery. She hasn't spoken to anyone for a while. Even her sentences feel rusty. I'm looking for a young male in his mid-twenties, dark hair, skinny build, a smoker on the balcony. Yes, yes. I know who you mean. The scrawny boy who's always smoking like the devil, right? Somewhere in the building, a child starts crying. You hear a radio tuned to a talk show and someone taking a shower. What's he in trouble for? No trouble. I just want to talk to him. Do you know where he lives? Talk? <laughs> what was so funny about that? He lives upstairs in room 28. Go to the balcony. It's one of those doors there. He's usually home in the evening. Thank you. We should go check out his apartment on the balcony. See if he's home. I'm looking for the parents of a kid named Kuno. The waiters are at the end of this hallway, right next to the communal bathroom. I have a few questions about those apartments. Ask away, policeman. Is one of the residents on vacation? Their mailbox is overflowing. People come and go. I don't keep an eye on everyone. They probably just moved or died. Hopefully somewhere else. What can you tell me about Cindy? The artiste? Nothing I can do about her, I'm afraid. She ruins the walls faster than I can clean them. Still, she leaves an old lady to her business. More than I can say for others. That's all. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, I'm off. That isn't just a five-pointed star. It's an inverted white pentagram cradled in a wreath of antlers. The iconography of communism, in other words. The star and antlers was developed in the sixth decade of the last century and quickly adopted by Mezov and the communards during the revolution. Even today, half a century after, the star and antlers retains the ability to evoke hope, disappointment, and fear in equal measure. Why is the star upside down? To symbolize the toppling of the old order. Also, some social democrats were already using it. What is the deal with the antlers? The wreath of antlers represents a natural crown. It was about building a society that could exist in accord with the natural world, and at the same time, 
above it. Why white? Because white is the color of peace. What does it evoke in me? Gone. Gone is the glory of hope. Only the scribblings of impoverished students remain in dirty hallways. You are the big communism builder now. It's you or no one. This door has been closed with a padlock. A chalk drawn number on the board says number 11. No reply. It's a solid lump of metal, but the shackle is deeply corroded. A solid pair of chain cutters would make short work of it. Better whip out those cutters. You won't get very far otherwise. The shackle snaps like a twig and the lock falls to the floor with a little thud. It should be possible to enter now. After you, detective. A plaster cast bust depicts a middle-aged man with impressive sideburns. The name on the plinth reads Kras Marzov. Father Mazov, the hero of the working class. Whoever lives here definitely shares your enthusiasm. There aren't many communists around, not after the revolution. Some youth still keep the ideology going, it seems. Kras Mazov was a sexual deviant, a zoophile probably. The lieutenant raises a brow. That's right. Filthy. Thank you for sharing this wonderful opinion on human sexuality. There aren't many communists around. Not after the revolution. Some youth still keep the ideology going, it seems. Whoever lives here needs to learn how the economy actually works. I suspect that's exactly what they are trying to do. There aren't many communists around. Not after the revolution. Some youth still keep the ideology going, it seems. Why does this tenant have a bust of Krasmazov in their bedroom? The white star, the photos on the wall. I think we have broken into the apartment of a young communard. How fitting. Master investigator, you just can't keep yourself away from locked and hidden places, can you? It is my duty as a cop to investigate every square inch of this world. Attaboy. The world's secrets were made for you. They wait patiently for you to uncover them. A shabby door hangs oddly on its hinges, secured to the doorframe with a safety chain. An unpaid energy bill is attached threatening to cut off the electricity. It's addressed to Mr. Uno Dodoita. Your heartbeat quickens. Palms go sweaty. The siren of amphetamine is singing you her song. Looks like we found where Kuno's dad lives. And the place comes with three months worth of utility bills. No response. The apartment numbers have fallen off the door, leaving the panel with a sticky one shaped shadow and a marker drawn two nothing happens it must be an ambush let's get your adrenaline pumping just in case you'll need to equip the chain cutters to enter snip right through the metal like a goddamn maniac you rip the chain off the door the links lie on the floor scattered don't let the quiet fool you the beast is in there somewhere, ready to rip you to shreds with a broken bottle. I know there's no stopping you, but let's at least make this quick.
A phone book lies open on the table, covering a stack of utility bills. Right next to it, in plain sight, sits a small bottle of amphetamine, conveniently equipped with a straw. You could slip the bottle right into your pocket. The lieutenant wouldn't even notice. Lieutenant, I have located psychoactive substances on this table. Good. Confiscate it. The minuscule amount of amphetamine doesn't interest the lieutenant in the slightest. He listens instead to something in the other room. He pocket the bottle as if it were the most natural thing in the world. Don't wait. Celebrate. Blast that shit right here. Take inventory of it once this boring table shit is done. Blast it before you face the beast, Deruita. You're going to need the encouragement. A bundle of clothes heaped on the bed. A stained parka, some towels and a duvet, some socks even. In the dark, it looks like a nest. Hold up, Lieutenant. Look at that pile of clothes. Mm -hmm. Something underneath there is breathing. It doesn't give a shit that you're a cop. Stop your hand now, or you're gonna die. It's not too late. No one's going to blame you for backing out. You don't have to do this. Just get out. Your hand touches a greasy duvet covered in cigarette burns and ketchup stains. You hear a growl. There is something alive underneath it. It's deep in suffering somehow. You see a 60-year-old fat red-headed man passed out from large amounts of alcohol and God knows what else. The smell of shit rises from his mouth. You don't have to take him down. He's already down. Kim. Is this thing even alive? I'm afraid it is. Look, it moves. And look, the other foot is camouflaged by a striped sock bearing the name Max Tor on the sole. Three toes are poking out of a hole. Max Tor is a gas company. He's wearing free socks from a gas company. They probably came with the bills. A groan rises from the man's throat, dry like a death rattle. He's trying to say something in his sleep. The bear is trying to wake up. Is this Kuno's father we're seeing? Well, judging by the color of his hair, I would say yes, it is. The lieutenant's right. The man's unwashed hair bears a familiar ginger tone. Even the hair on his chest is coppery. The light from the window falls into his half-open eyes. Nocturnal Lagophalmus, the likelihood of falling asleep with partially open eyelids, rises after stimulant use and heavy drinking. There's still plenty to be scared of here, just not what you thought. I can't believe it. Kuno's dad isn't a loser. It must be someone else. Are you saying a man who looks like Kuno broke into his father's apartment and passed out in his father's bed? This man won't be feeding his family anytime soon. Not that he was, but at least he won't be beating his son. A pair of half-open bug eyes is staring back at you from the dark, empty and frozen. It's clear that the person behind them is not awake. His half-open eyes give him the look of a dead man. But he is in there, and not enjoying himself. This is serious damage. I'm still not sure he's not dead. Look, he's trying to communicate. Maybe we should help him somehow. What is there to do? We could turn him on his side so he doesn't choke on his own vomit. But he's already on his side. Excellent form. We could take him to Remedy or Saint Baptiste, but he doesn't have money for medical services. The arm sauce would turn him down. 
They don't do charity for people who are trying to kill themselves. Besides, he'll be dead in a few. Years. Months. Weeks. The pile of blankets grunts miserably. I took your amphetamine, old man. Silence. Only heat emanates from the sleeping body. He wouldn't be too thrilled to learn you stole his stash. It was the last thing keeping him functional. The man groans once again, but his tongue keeps failing him. It's impossible to make out the syllables. A hand emerges from the blankets, trying to gesticulate something. And then it dawns upon you, clear and surreal. Pigs, he says. He's trying to call you pigs. Are you going to let a semi-conscious degenerate disrespect you? What did you just say? His hand falls back on the bed, limp and defeated. A loud snore escapes his mouth. He's asleep again. At least he got to say his piece. Side, rearranging the furniture. The number on the panel says 10. The walking stops abruptly, but no one comes to the door. You can feel tension on the other side. Sounded like a woman. A woman's shoes. A poor communard from the looks of it. The room is barely bigger than a closet. This is the police. Open up. Let's go. We don't have a reason to get inside that apartment. Later then, entering this door seems a physical challenge. It's generally easier to do things if you have literally any reason. chills around you. Dust settles on the stony floor. A former architect stands before a slice of window, a room plan in her hand. A cold wave has made the air in the building stand still and frozen, with temperatures falling down to minus 20 degrees Celsius. Is red from the cold. She's breathing on her fingers, clasping the plan. Traces of sadness are visible in her expression. Faint pencil lines on paper depict the same place, but a missing eastern wall connects the room with the neighboring apartment. Ideas for arranging the furniture have been jotted down. It's clean and empty, with new tapestry embellishing the walls. A standard HB graphite pencil has fallen off a three-legged stool in the middle of the room. She had an eye for beauty. Ruination has come. The broken arches betray the once grand history of this building. It towered over the harbor until it happened. A great force from the northeast fired into the city. Heavy artillery shelled the coastline, fired from the water, a straight shot into Revachol. The tenement acted as a defensive wall against the worst of the shelling until it was destroyed and they had a direct firing line. The wind blows through your hair. The sea breeze cuts around you, high on the balcony as you stare over the edge at the sea. 
The waves of the Martinez Inlet rolled over the fallen remains of the building. The dark waters obscured the better part of the remains. This is where the damage came from. From somewhere in the inlet, the cannons. What didn't fall into the ocean was used as scrap. What wasn't used as scrap was thrown into the ocean. Those arches acted as support for something greater than what you see now. Only three stories stand where nine to twelve once did. Restoration has failed. What the shilling took out was never rebuilt. Underwater, iron helmets have sunk deep into the sand and the mud. Helmets of soldiers and their finger bones too. And clavicles littering the ocean floor. Who did this? This damage. A fleet, the combined armies of Occident and Grad, with Mesk volunteers, a five nation army, hundreds of vessels. They massed airships further down in the Bay of Revachol. The artillery was so powerful. The ships not only required gyroscopic stabilization, they were anchored into the ocean floor as well. Many are still there to this day. If you squint, you can just barely see the shadow on the water, far in the northeast. Cannon, coalition warship, Archer, can shoot 50 shells a minute on 20 coaligned arches. They will reach the city in 58 seconds. Hey Kim, do you know who shelled our city? The coalition, but that was a long time ago. I think we should move on, it's chilly up here. He does not like talking politics of this kind. He fears the discussion might lead to disagreements, as it often does. I wonder what I look like on this edge. From the eyes of a seagull, a nest of brown hair not worth the 50-foot dive. From a pedestrian on the dock, a rugged man staring out to sea, mere feet from fatality. From a guest on the balcony of the whirling in rags, a silhouette imposing enough to be seen at a distance. The chill is bracing. The salt hangs in the air. The wind from the ocean pushes at you, smoothing your moustache. have learned how to saunter up staircases. I didn't think you could do that with hooves. But here you are. That's right. We've evolved. Yeah, I can see that. Cool mutations. I've got you cornered. Hand over the brush. Ooh, police brutality. That's the good stuff. How come you're letting this baby rat run circles around you? End this now. Cindy, give me the goddamn brush. Fine, take it. I'm all out of fuel oil anyway. You know what you should be able to find in your government-issued vehicle? Red dyed heavy fuel oil. Can't I just use paint? Are you kidding me? Fuel oil is so much cooler. No way you're disfiguring that beautiful wall with something as pedestrian as ordinary paint. Kim, my friend, would you be willing to sacrifice some of your fuel oil for art? My fuel oil is for my kinema. Use your own fuel if you are unable to contain your artistic impulses, but please, leave my kinema out of it. Catch you later, Cindy. <laughs> 